I know at this point you might be getting tired of all this focus on the concept of faithing. The best teachers or theologians know how hard it is to impart the true meaning of this word. Among other creators like myself who make videos on this topic, I like several, and I find them explaining the same concepts as these videos with the same kind of understanding. For example, one of them is a YouTube channel, Inspiring Philosophy. Another very sharp young man, and I think if all you have is his videos, you'll be just fine as a Christian. I'm not implying anything about his agreement with anything I say on these videos by saying that. I'm just saying that when I watch them, I see similarities. In this world of guilt by association, I just want to be clear about that. But his channel is worth checking out if you enjoy any of my stuff. The reason I bring this up is that a funny thing happened on his channel. He debated a well-known YouTube atheist, and it didn't go very well, mainly because of this concept of pistis. It's funny because after much explaining, he had to make a whole other additional video stating that this guy still didn't understand pistis. That's actually the title of the video. It may not be funny to everyone, but to me, who's been trying to explain this concept to people for 30 plus years, I totally get it. As I've said before, it's our language that defeats us. It's next to impossible to explain to someone a verb when they've been raised from birth thinking it's a noun. It's not that they can't understand it. Most can. The challenge is that even after someone gets it, immediately the next time they use it in conversation, it's impossible to speak English properly without confusing verb and noun. The whole language breaks down. I've spent years studying this effect of language and psychology, and I've got more to say on this topic, but I'll spare you at this point. It's compounded by an educational system since the early 1900s that teaches everyone to think in terms of relationships, which are mainly represented by verbs. I go into more detail on this in the authority videos and will eventually pull them all together in one place. Suffice it to say, it can be a complex subject, and I'm just trying to get across what pistis means right now. I just wanted to point out why I may be spending so much time on this topic. That's the first reason. I know how hard it is to be understood. The second reason, it's nothing less than our relationship with God. That's what God wants from us, first, last, and foremost. It is the sum of our relationship with Him. Adhering to the law was never intended to be a relationship with God. It's faithing trust, period. The root of our spiritual warfare at this point in history is the simple confusion about what is supposed to be our relationship with God. And this is the root. We talked about the definition of faithing, the blueprint, so to speak, being an action taken with your body, which is based upon a belief in your mind and an emotional confidence, all three united. I just started that new series on authority, which is an important concept for the belief part. You can see these videos here. Then I went through several examples in the Bible about the great men of faith, those same examples listed in Hebrews 11. I could go on in this vein for many videos, and I eventually will, but in the interest of not boring you all to death, I'm going to wrap the faithing part of the study up in this video before moving on to the next concept, love. Another good group of filmmakers I really appreciate is the American Gospel Bunch, which you can find at AmericanGospelFilm.com. In the first installment of their trilogy, they make the statement that many modern Christians are unfamiliar with the true biblical concept of faith. And then they mention there's a similar misunderstanding about love. I was halfway through writing this book when I finally got to see their movies and was really encouraged to see others with this opinion. I had really started to believe that these concepts had been lost to time. But as confused as people are about the meaning of faith, love has been even more twisted and abused. But for this video, I want to move from Hebrews and the heroes of faith to Romans and Galatians and look at the same phrase, same line, same words that we find in all three books that are at the heart of Pauline theology. I know there's some ambiguity about whether or not Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. I think that these three books reflect the thinking that I think comes out of the heart of Paul's message. We're certain, and it's widely accepted, that Paul is the author of Romans and Galatians. However, there is some ambiguity about the authorship of Hebrews. Despite this uncertainty, it is clear that the theological concepts at the heart of Hebrews are identical to those found in the other Pauline writings. Some scholars suggest that another author may have appended it, but the content itself is in line with what Paul writes of those mysteries of the kingdom that God revealed to him. Those who credit it to another author are usually looking at the differences in style and language rather than its relevance to Pauline thought and theology. While there are differences in emphasis between Hebrews and other Pauline writings, the underlying truths are the same. 
And that is what I want to focus on as we move out of the book of Hebrews into the books of Romans and Galatians for this video. Paul's influence on the Bible cannot be overstated. The books of Romans and Hebrews stand out as two of the most important works within the Christian philosophy. In contrast, Paul's letters to the Galatians is an expression of his righteous anger. He takes issue with the actions of Peter, influenced by James, the so-called brother of Jesus, who has begun to undermine Paul's teachings and the word of God itself. Peter's call to return to traditional practices is misguided, and Paul is unwavering in his assertion that such an approach is entirely antithetical to the true teachings of Christ. Peter was always a problem for God. I've covered this before, some of these over-the-top things he did. Paul and Peter had to have a conflict over what was going on in Galatia. Paul was the father who had founded that church, and along came Peter, stamping some traditions on him. So Paul is a little bit emotional in the Galatian letter. He's banging away and saying to those people that he brought out of the darkness, how can you be so foolish? He makes a point of telling them, you started off right with faithing, and now you're trying to continue with your works. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? I have to point out, like I always do, that the word perfect there actually means complete. These are two completely different concepts. Don't let the idea of damnable perfection creep in. It has destroyed more people's faithing than you might think. God is not looking for perfection. If what I'm saying seems wrong to you, consider this. This is actually exactly what these three verses are saying to us. What has saved you? Adhering to all the do's and don'ts of the law or faithing. That's in the very verse right there I just read. So what makes more sense for the next verse? Are you so foolish that after Paul starts you in the spirit with faithing that you then try to be completed in your adherence to the law? Or are you so foolish that after Paul starts you in the spirit with faithing that you try to be perfect in adhering to the law? It's a subtle distinction, but an important one. As many people before me have said, the devil's in the details. And so Paul in that book reached out with his emotion and personal relationship with God. But the Galatian letter is a river of passionate outpouring, protective as a father to Gentile converts, that he alone has planted the seed of faith in their heart. He brought them a new life, and his congregation is being invaded by those that he calls perverts and bewitchers, and he pulls no punches. As he strips bare the reality of the Christian faith, which is faith, grace, and peace, and not works. Romans, on the other hand, was a letter written to a church he had never been to. Paul to the Romans wrote to a church that he had not founded. Probably, since the letter was sent by Phoebe, a lady businesswoman who was passing from Corinth to Rome, and Paul, during his sojourn in Corinth, wrote the letter to Rome and had it delivered to that household of faith, as distinct from the Jewish church that Priscilla and Aquila were pastors of, he sent it to that church that in fact met in the household of the Silurian king Caradoc, or Caradocus as the Latins called him. The Silurian king who had been captured and granted because of his eloquent defense and speech before the Roman Senate his life. That is recorded even by Tacitus, the Roman historian. He so moved the Senate that they spared his life. The one general that the greatest of the Roman generals had never been able to defeat was given house arrest and a stipend from the Silurian kingdom in England. And it was that household that became the Christian church in Rome. The daughter of Caradoc was adopted by the Roman emperor Claudius and renamed Claudia from her English name Gladys. She married a Roman senator, Rufus, who is addressed in the latter part of the Roman letter with Paul's words indicating he was either a half-brother of Paul or a full brother because they had the same mother that Paul sends greetings to. It was Gladys, renamed Claudia, daughter of Caradoc, who was the brother of Linus, the son of Caradoc, who became the first Roman bishop of the church at Rome. And this church began in that house of the English king. The daughter and son and grandfather of the daughter and son of father of Caradoc who had been converted by none other than Joseph of Arimathea. And the earliest church above ground in Glastonbury, England, 
was the source of the faith that transplanted itself to Rome and became the recipient of the Roman letter. Though Paul had a relative connection to the husband of Gladys, he was writing to a church that he did not found, as already said of Joseph of Arimathea and those early disciples that came up through the south of France, crossing over to Cornwall and around Glastonbury, they were the source of the faith of the church at Rome. So the tenor of the letter to the Roman church is that of a preacher or philosopher who's introducing his philosophy. That's why the Roman letter is the most broadly stated philosophical treatment of faith that Paul the Apostle wrote. And then Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews that bears his stamp out of the heart of Paul and filled with intrinsically Pauline statements that cannot be separated from the vast output that provides two-thirds of the New Testament. There, Paul is writing to Hebrews. They've seen the temple destroyed. They've seen the material elements of their faith wiped away. He's writing to restore their faith in the moment of despair by comparing what they had second class when the comparison unfolds to the faith they have in Christ, which is first class. And there's a little passion from one who's been one of them in reminding them the way of faith is superior. And it is a letter written to encourage fellows of his heritage from within that frame of reference. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. It was through these letters that Luther started lecturing first on the book of Psalms, but then he began his lectures on Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews, with which he uses a slightly different focus for each, as I've pointed out. To the Romans, he's philosophic. To the Hebrews, he's encouraging, a faith that will prevail no matter what. To the Galatians, he's full of fire, as he fights to protect the perversion of the faith that he originally delivered unto them saints. In each of these cases, the fulcrum or lever of each argument, the pivotal verse in each, is a verse out of the Old Testament. Out of Habakkuk, in the Old Testament, chapter 2, he lifts that statement and places it in all three of these prominent letters that unfold his philosophy of Christ that we build our Christian beliefs upon. The just shall live by faith. He takes that verse, and in Romans 1.17, in Hebrews 10.38, and in Galatians 3.1, the same frame. The just shall live by faith. But he does have a different emphasis on each one. The verse becomes a fulcrum of faithing in these three basic streams of Christian philosophy. Luther's lecture formed the Protestant Reformation, coming from his study of these letters, Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews. Throughout his ministry, he focused on the book he loved the most, acknowledging that it played a somewhat more important role to his foundation. Galatians, using the phrase I've said before, I am married to the book of Galatians. No other book produced the Protestant Reformation to the degree that Galatians did. In each of these letters, he puts just a little different emphasis in that phrase, an emphasis that characterizes the tone of that book. If you were to take this verse, the just shall live by faith, out of the book of Romans, you'll see that he emphasizes the word just. And if you were to say it with emphasis, it would sound like the just shall live by faith. The book of Romans philosophically takes this verse and develops it by saying, just, the just, by faith shall live. To the Hebrews, you could find he underlines the word faith. Paul has one message, but the emphasis tilts on the philosophic description of righteousness by faith. The just, by faith, shall live. To the Hebrews, the emphasis is on faith, encouraging them through their problems. So you would say that the just shall live by faith. In the Galatians letter, life is the issue. The just by faith shall live, because it is life, not dead works, and the death they produce, that the Galatian letter is all about. I need to point out this emphasis every time, because it's important to realize that you cannot understand Galatians fully without Romans and Hebrews. You cannot understand Romans fully without Galatians and Hebrews. You can't understand Hebrews fully without Romans and Galatians. If you had no Bible but these three books, I believe you could get all the understanding of faith you needed. If you had nothing but one, you could still find salvation. But full understanding takes all three. Now, to get there in that understanding of this phrase, 
we have to go through the New Testament meaning of love. And I always run into a challenge, not knowing should I talk about this fulcrum of faith first or should I talk about the process of love first. I'm going to try to make it work as a segue this time, and we'll readdress the same issue from the other direction in the next chapter. Quickly, though, I have said before throughout these videos that Greek is a very, very precise language. English is not that precise. English is like Hebrew the Old Testament is written in, in that it largely depends on context. It depends on context in a way that the New Testament Greek does not. Greek is so precise, it has multiple words for the single word we use in English, love. There's eros, which means romantic love, and that's not what I'm talking about here. What we need to talk about briefly is phylos, which means brotherly love. It's where we get Philadelphia, which is called the city of brotherly love. And agapao, which we talk about as agape in many churches today, but the word is agapao. Agapao is selfless, uncalculating, giving to the self with no thought of anything in return, based upon an intrinsic value that you see in the object being loved. You give of yourself with no thought of anything in return, sacrificially and selflessly turning your love loose. Now hold on, because here's the point. What Philos conveys conceptually is, you do for me, I do for you. Perfect balance. I don't have to worry because whatever I do for you, you'll do just as much for me, and we end up balanced out. It is the kind of love that everybody seeks. That's the balance everyone hopes for. That's the fairness of a love relationship described today when we talk about what do you bring to the table. I do for you, you do for me. You do for me, I do for you. It's not in a transactional sense in that we make exchanges. It's in the sense of a partnership where together we create something greater than either of us has alone. No one's taken advantage of each other. The loving relationship grows and flourishes. The problem is, if you seek that, you will never find it. And I don't think I'm the only sinner in this world that can understand that. Isn't it funny how just a generation or two after this Christian message has been corrupted and sanitized so it can fit Christianity on the buffet table equally with all other world religions and spirituality, that love and relationships and dating is at the worst point ever? The minute I find out somebody is doing for me just to get something in return, I start backing off. We all do. The moment that I think your love, so to speak, is utilitarian and selfishly designed to get me to do for you, I'm going to start looking out for me. It's about the lives of trust. That's the paradox. Philos sought produces Philos never obtained, paradoxically. To all these Americans complaining about how dating sucks, isn't it funny how a bunch of Greeks 2,000 years ago could figure this out and we can't? Agapau, on the other hand, now that the paradox is if I or you can ever be convinced that someone is giving of themselves to us agapau style with no thought of anything in return, sacrificing selfless, pouring out of self toward me with no thought of anything given in return, it's like a magnet. I find inevitably that makes me want to respond in kind. This is how confidence artists take advantage of you. They don't cheat you by taking your confidence. They take advantage by giving you their confidence, and you have no choice but to respond emotionally to that gift. But if I can ever find someone acting that way to me, I can't help but respond to them. If you're ever drowning in a river, you know you're drowning, and someone puts themselves at risk by diving in and risk their life to bring you to shore, you don't have to talk yourself into liking them when you get to the shore. The hard part is following through. Depending upon a lot of things in your background, a lot of things in your nature, how you will follow through on that instant response varies. We see this in those that have been burned so many times before who come with all this baggage. They respond in bizarre ways to someone loving them in this way. Sometimes the immediate response comes out of the imageness of man itself, which is to say the way phylos is obtained is to give agapau. The way phylos is produced is to encounter agapau unselfish, incalculable, giving for the benefit of the other without a thought of anything in return is the only way someone can get phylos. It's the only way. Some of us are so coated over with scar tissue and selfishness that we are limited in our ability to respond to agapal. The first instant reaction, if this is the case, is we try to poke holes in agapal. But even then, when we see it, the first response is always there. Now get out your Greek interlinear testament, your lexicons and your concordances, not once in God's book does God command us or place as a requirement in Christianity that we have to give philos. What God commands is the love like selfish, 
giving up Agapa with no thought of anything in return. Because God knows if he can get Agapa going, Philos will be the result. What I'm trying to get across here is this process. You can't get Philos by acting or faking it till you make it or anything except as a response to Agapa. And that Agapa is something you can do. You just have to get over yourself or your ego out of the way. This is the first link in the chain of logic behind this the just shall live by faith fulcrum. For the next link, we've got to talk a little bit about sin. This is where the nature of sin gets confused. The law was never intended to be a whip to force us to God. God is not interested in coerced love. It was always ever meant as a school teacher to convince us of our helplessness to sin, our bondage and slavery to it that's built into our very flesh. This is the true meaning of carnal. I can't tell you how tired I get of people making carnal to be just about sex. If we can ever truly understand the helpless condition of our sinning nature, how it's built into our very bodies, if we can ever truly come to grips with our helpless bondage to our own selfish nature, which forever seeks its own way, and to comprehend how little God needs us, that the one who spoke and not a thing became everything, cared enough for us to give himself in our place, to even comprehend that state of helpless sin and the love that God showed because of some intrinsic value he sees in us, and not in some abstract general Christ dying for the world sense, but for me and for you person to person. We can't help but have an instant response to that one who did that for us. That's why we start with the resurrection. Jesus was giving that agapao to us with his death. The people of that time in the Greek frame, that culture that was arguably the most intelligent and logical ever on this earth, could see this chain of logic. It's been muddled hopelessly ever since. It's not some poetry or petty slogans or mystical magic. Jesus had a relationship with God where he demonstrated for us by dying, trusting God to raise him. That's hanging his body, faithing. He did it out of a sacrificial love for us, implying he sees a value worthy of it in us. If we ever can realize the depth of that kind of agapal love, we respond with philos. We can't help it. Knowing we can't keep all those do's and don'ts that some people still want to judge us by should convince us of the enormity of that gift. So God had to give us those laws for this purpose. Philos is that equal, balanced, you do for me, I do for you kind of love. Jesus' agapal was faithing pistis, our philos to him is faithing pistis. It's hard to make it any more simple, and I know most people still don't get the depths of it. That's why phylos is a reaction. That's how we start with that reaction. And pistis is how we keep going, how we finish, how we complete. Being made just by Jesus' sacrifice, we live by faith. The just, with equal giving of pistis, makes our lives about that pistis. The just shall live by faith. That's the fulcrum. That's the central point of the books of Galatians, Romans, and Hebrews, which carry that line in their message.